Okay, well. <laughs> so, welcome to my talk, Introduction to FPGA Programming. My name is Weisstein Hannes. I am a student at TU Graz. I study computer engineering in my master's. I'm interested in low-level security and hardware. And also, I'm a member of Los Fuzzies. Um, so, about the contents of this talk, I'm going to, to talk about what are FPGAs, how do we use them, I'm going to tell you a bit about hardware description languages and some, reason why, some reasons why we use FPGAs and what disadvantages they have, and of course some real-world examples of how FPGAs are used. So, what are FPGAs? FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Um, basically, they are an integrated circuit of programmable logic blocks, um, which can be reconfigured after manufacturing. Uh, this is done via a bit file that gets loaded into the FPGA and effectively, effectively tells it how to behave. Um, this bit file um, containing the behavior of the FPGA gets defined using a hardware description language, which is similar to a programming language, uh, but not actually really a programming language. Some examples of FPGAs I have here. This is a tiny FPGA, costs about $38. This is uh, just a development board with an FPGA on it. It costs about $150. And this is a system on a chip with an FPGA and an ARM core and some I.O. and pins. Um, some additional chips for audio and stuff um, costs $200 plus, depending on what features you want to get. So, how do we use them? Um, as I said, first, we need to implement the behavior of the hardware in an HDL. Um, we have to create a test bench um, to test it in a simulator. Um, because this is behaving like hardware, it is very hard to test. Um, if you're using the hardware, you would have to use oscilloscopes. So using the simulator to verify your design is a very good choice. Um, when the HDL behaves as you want it to in the simulator, you synthesize your code. Uh, synthesizing the code makes sure that it is possible to, um, to implement this behavior in hardware, and it also tells you if hardware constraints are met. For example, the, simu the simulator assumes that every gate, every XOR gate is ideal, so it flips immediately, but in the real world, we have some capacitors that have to be charged. We have current that has to flow, so it's not going to be instantly flipped if you flip one of the inputs. And if you then chain hundreds of XOR gates behind each other, if you run them too fast, you might just miss some clock, because the delay is just too long. And synthesizing the code will tell you that you might run into trouble there. Then, when we did all that, we create a bit file and flash it to FPGA. And then we have to test on the hardware, because the simulation is not perfect, and it might not behave as, as you expect it to every time. So I talked a lot about hardware description languages. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about those. Basically, they are programming languages. Um, in quotes, for hardware. Um, they are used to develop for FPGAs and also for ASICs. ASIC stands for uh, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Um, yeah, popular languages that get used uh, nowadays are VHDL, Verilog, and System Verilog, which is a superset of Verilog, which has some additional features. Um, yeah, as I said, it's not really a programming language, as the name implies, it's a description of hardware. It, it's basically a bunch of wires and gates that you define via code. 
So this is not a program. Uh, in, my, in my example, I have chosen Verilog because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, Verilog has different abstraction levels. The first one is the gate level. Um, in the gate level, you are actually connecting logic gates with each other. You don't have any procedural logic. You can't do one thing after another. You just connect gates. It's really similar to actually building the hardware on a breadboard with actual gates. And of course, this is very low level. And if you want to have high level functionality, this is very hard to do at this level. Um, one more abstracted level is the RTL level, which stands for Register Transfer Level. Here, some of the low-level features are abstracted. This supports kind of sequential logic. Um, it supports registers that can hold a value. You can do that in gate-level um, logic by building a flip-flop, but in RTL level, it does it for you. Um, here, I might mention a clock, in this case, is just a signal that jumps from 0 to 1 at specific times. And usually, in hardware, you update your values at the positive clock edge. There are hardwares that can do stuff at negative clock edges. It's basically just a design choice. But the clock is effectively our heartbeat um, that, that we use to do stuff one after another at specific time points. Um, procedural logic can be implemented at the RTL level uh, via state machines. So we can't say, do this, and then after x milliseconds, do that. But we can say, OK, our clock speed, our clock hits every so-and-so milliseconds, and then we count up, and after the fifth clock, we do something. We, don't, we can't wait for something, but we can let some amount of clocks pass and then do something. So, yeah, it's basically a count. In, in the hardware, it's a counter and then a comparator, and then we do something with the signal. This is still synthesizable. So if we, if we write something in RTL level, we can still synthesize it, and we can still run it uh, on the FPGA. The third level we have is the behavioral level. Um, this is kind of similar to a traditional programming language. Um, we have... Just a second. So the next button on my laptop is right next to the end button. Um, yeah, so... Um, in the behavioral level, we have procedural logic. We can wait for some time. We can have while loops. We can do stuff one after another, um, which sounds very convenient. The downside of this is it is not synthesizable. You might now think, okay, basically it's useless then. Um, it's really convenient to create a test bench so we can run it in a simulator. The simulator can simulate uh, behavioral logic. Um, so if we implement our thing that we really want to implement in RTL logic, um, we can build a test bench for it in behavioral logic and test it more easily. So the basics of Verilog now. I've talked a lot about we define hardware. How does this actually look like? So Verilog basically has two data types, one a wire, which in other languages can be called a net, and a register, which is similar to a variable. The wire, you can think of like really a trace on a PCB. It does not hold any value. One building block of your design might pull it to a high voltage level and a low voltage level, and another one might read from it. But as soon as nobody writes anything to, or nobody applies any current or any voltage to that wire, it's basically undefined. A register can hold value. A register effectively is a flip-flop. So it can hold values, it can get updated, and you can read from it later. 
There are two assignment operators, the equals operator, which is blocking, and the uh, less than equals operator, which is non-blocking. We will see uh, what that means later. We'll then show you some code. And there are vectors. So the wires and registers by, by themselves are just one bit. And we can then define vectors of, for in this example, eight bits. So we have, yeah, eight wires side by side, which can represent a byte. And the constants in Verilog are defined a bit weird. This might look very different to usual programming or to other languages. Um, they have to have a bit width, a base, and a value. The bit width is important if you, for example, have negative numbers. So the two's complement uh, can be handled correctly. The next concept that Verilog has is modules. Um, you can think of modules as kind of similar to classes in object-oriented programming. You can instantiate them and reuse them. They can consist of sub-modules, and they have ports to interface with the outside. So the ports are basically, if you have an IC that you solder onto a, a circuit board, the, the ports are the pins on that IC. And you can, you can connect a wire to that and connect it with some other IC. Um, yeah, ports, as I said, are a connection to the outside world. They can either be an input, an output, or in output. Um, vectors or scalars, so you can have just a single bit or a vector of bits. And per default, they are always wires. But we can explicitly set, uh, tell Verilog that this should be a register, so it can save a value. Another thing that's important for the code that I'm going to show you is the always block. The always block is supported in RTL logic, and it can be sensitive to signals. That means that they get executed, in quotes, um, whenever the, sh the chosen signal changes. We can say, okay, our input A of our adder that we have is uh, whenever that changes, we want to update the output value to a new calculation result. Um, you can also, what's really um, the thing that's m that always blocks are most used for, you can be sensitive to clock edges. So you can say, okay, at the positive edge of our clock, so when our clock signal goes from zero to one, at that exact time uh, point, we do whatever we need to do. We update our state, we do some calculations, whatever. Um, yeah, they are sequential logic, and they are, as I said, used to implement state machines, and uh, are a really important building block of uh, more cl complex applications. Here's an example of, our, um, of a simple module. As we can see, we here have a clock and reset signal, which are both inputs. Um, you need a reset signal to have defined values at the beginning of your module. There is a way to define an, in an initial block in a module that sets values to zero, kind of like a constructor, but this is not synthesizable because the hardware does not really start up. It just gets some uh, power and turns on, uh, so it doesn't effectively run any code, so it can't reset itself. So we need a reset signal to reset our values to our initial state. And here we have then this always block is sensitive to reset and the clock, um, both uh, at the positive edge. And if reset is not set, we use the non-blocking operator um, to update the value. Because this is a non-blocking operator, they swap values. Because this doesn't happen one after another, this happens at the same time. If we, if we would use the blocking operator here, they would get set to the same value and then stay that way. So that's why there are two operators. And this is also something that makes Verilog code sometimes a bit hard to read if you're not used to it. Um, here's another module that I've implemented for a CTF last week. Um, 
as you can see, we have, as in the first module, a reset block that just resets it to zero. We have a counter that at every, every positive clock edge counts up and saves some input data from our input port to our state. And here we see the other important part of, um, of, of hardware description language, uh, languages, which is uh, combinatorial logic. So we set this lock, which is an output bit, we set it to the result of this comparison. This comparison just compares some XORT value to a static um, key. Um, and it goes to one when they are equal. This is checked in how this is just a hardware comparator. Uh, we do this, this never gets executed, it's just, you can imagine a comparator in hardware that just sets its output bit to one. Whenever, whenever out changes, this um, gets re-evaluated. Re and this is just, um, this rearrange just takes the bits and scrambles them around. So it's, it's not a complex uh, module, it's just, um, yeah. If you're not used to Verilog, it might look a bit scary. This is how a test bench looks like. Um, it could be done in a bit more beautiful way, but I was lazy. So I set the clock to zero, reset to one, set the clock to one. This is a weight, so this is behavioral logic. We cannot synthesize that, but for testing we can use those delays. And I just wrote all the input data one after another uh, to the to the module, and then displayed the lock to check if it actually unlocked. So, why would we use FPGAs? Disadvantages of FPGA. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, seriously. Why would you use FPGAs as developers? Uh, they are dynamically reprogrammable, which means we have lower R&D costs. We can just reprogram it if our first design didn't work. We don't have to design custom chips. We can just slap an FPGA on our, um, on our circuit board and program it to behave however, however we want. And because of that, we can have really fast prototyping. For customers, um, they are pretty fast. They are, in most cases, faster than your general purpose microcontroller or processor. Um, also, compared to those general purpose processors, they have a really high performance per watt ratio. They are really, really efficient. And their processing time is really predictable because it's effectively kind of hardware. And they also cost way less than having to design a whole custom chip. The custom chip would be faster, but it's a trade-off that you have to that you have to make. If you want the peak performance, you have, you of course have to decide a custom chip. But most many times, FPGA is enough. Here's a quick comparison of encryption speeds. As you can see, general-purpose uh, processors are way way slower than FPGAs, even a low-area FPGA. And if we look at the speeds of the ASIC of the custom chip. Um, that, of course, is, again, way faster than the FPGA. Disadvantages that we have is that um, they are tricky to program and test. This is not your usual programming. You have to think about it in a different way. So if you are a programmer and you want to get into the FPGA world, you have to learn a bit a new way of thinking. The simulations also aren't perfect. So something that might work in a simulator might not work in real life. And yeah, as I said, it's a different approach to programming. And it's a really niche topic. You, don't, you won't find as many good Stack Overflow posts on FPGAs than you would find on Java programming. And the IDEs and the tooling is many times proprietary and not good. Who here has used Vivado before? 
who here liked using Vivado. Exactly. Um, yeah. I heard that the open source community made this a bit easier in the last few years. So maybe it, it's getting better. So now some quick uh, example applications uh, of FPGAs. The Proxmark 3 is an RFID research tool which was designed at the time where software-defined radios weren't really available. So they had to make something custom. So they chose to use a microcontroller for the high-level functionality to communicate with the computer, chose an FPGA to have enough performance to uh, be able to do the RFID stuff. And now we get the advantages that you still get updates for this tool after all those years. Also, Microsoft Project Catapult, they use FPGAs in data centers for speeding up AI applications. They didn't really specify that much, but I guess they, from what I've understood from it, they train uh, AI models and then program FPGAs with those models, which is very high performance and uh, efficient. And they use it also in networking to allow um, data centers to be reconfigured dynamically without wasting processing power on networking, because the FPGAs do that. Also, cheap signal processing hardware needs the speed to reach um, high frequencies, for example, for oscilloscopes, but not that many people buy cheap oscilloscopes, so they use the uh, ASIC doesn't make sense because the upfront cost is too high. So they use FPGAs, which is cheap, fast enough for most cases, and everyone's happy. The, 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 the seller sells his tools, doesn't have high research cost, uh, high R&D costs, and the customers get a cheap oscilloscope. How to get started with FPGAs? Learn on HDL, try it, buy one, and hack around. <laughs> There's no real way, you just have to do stuff with it. So, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes? On one of the slides, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and positive edge of the So the question was, uh, why, is the, why is the always block here sensitive to the positive edge of the reset? And wouldn't it then be uh, only sensitive to that positive edge? Um, it's actually sensitive to both. So if, if the reset is pulled too high, it resets immediately. And if it stays high at every clock that it gets, it's also resetting. Because this if... Um, Sorry? They the correct thing then. Yes. So, yeah, if you synthesize it, it does the correct thing. Yes? Um, when I have some um, like additions or multiplications, um, is that handled in the RTL level or is it handled in the So, the question was if additions and multiplications are handled in the RTL. Um, that depends a bit. Um, multiplications by two will just get uh, translated to bit shifts. The compiler is smart enough for that. Um, for additions, it will implement some adder, so you don't have to do that manually. I think for multiplications, it might depend on the compiler, but I think it might not be uh, able to handle like arbitrary multiplications. But I'm not sure about that either. Uh, the, qu the question was how easy it is to implement uh, serial communication. Um, actually, for many of the standard things, 
you have already ready-made IP blocks that handle stuff for you. Um, many of the proprietary vendors have a large library of IP blocks that you can purchase or license somehow, or some are maybe also free. So you can just import the serial communication block and do it um, that way. Um, many chips also, uh, many FPGA development boards also have a serial communication chip on board, so you can communicate with them and that handles the connection to the FPGA itself. Yes? The question was if there is an open, open source community for ready-made modules. Um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but I'm, or I, I'm pretty sure that there are some modules that are available. So, for example, AES uh, modules are readily available. Um, so I actually don't use FPGAs that much in my free time. So um, the things I've done, we have used IP blocks and then extended on them. But most of the time, we just implemented functionality in a part of a project. Yes? Yes, so the question was about the TPM, um, if that was related to trusted platform modules. Yes, so this was a CTF challenge. Uh, the challenge was to give it the right input so it would unlock. So it was a reverse engineering challenge. And yeah, it was the challenge description was something like, I can't install Windows 11 because I have no TPM, so I made my own. Uh, so that's the reason why it's called TPM. Yes? Uh, the question was if there is a, a limitation of how many registers and, and gates you can fit in FPGA. Yes, um, generally more, more expensive FPGAs have more uh, lookup tables and, and blocks. And if you do something like a really high-speed crypto implementation, you can run out of space and you can, on a small FPGA, just not be able to fit everything that you would want to. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I think if there's no more questions, I'm a, over time already, so <laughs> thank you for your attention. <laughs>